Hello. We are going to go through a presentation here on MLA formatting. The material in this presentation, in this PowerPoint, is taken from the Easy Writer 4th edition and also from the Purdue OWL website, which is updated to the latest version of the MLA handbook. The MLA handbook in the 8th edition is designed to provide formatting for a number of different disciplines, particularly for the humanities. And so the kind of guidelines the MLA handbook is written for focuses specifically on disciplines such as English and philosophy, history, and some other, some other areas. The purpose of it is to give people a way to reference the research that they have done. So when you do research, uh, you consult a number of resources, and when people read your work, when they read your research, they need a way that is standardized, that everybody uses and everybody recognizes, that they can go back and look at your research. And MLA provides that. MLA also provides a format that allows students, and in some cases professional academics, to present their work in a format that is recognized uh, by other scholars in the field. So that within a department or sometimes within a discipline, sometimes within a school, uh, everybody is writing in, in generally the same way. It is, it is a tool. Obviously, there's nothing of ultimate importance uh, to the MLA style guide. And sometimes teachers will make some modifications, uh, as I do. And uh, we'll see that as we go through. What I'm asking is that uh, you abide by the rules of the MLA format for all papers that you turn into me. I will make a couple of modifications as we go through, and I will tell you where the instructions that I give are idiosyncratic, as it were, uh, to my uh, classes. And hopefully it's helpful to you and also helpful to me as we work together on uh, producing uh, works of original research you have put together and I can easily track down the sources that you have used to compose your work. This information does come from the 8th edition of the MLA Handbook. Moving on, this presentation will cover three main areas. First, we will look at formatting. This covers how your pages should be set up, exactly what a MLA formatted document should look like. The second is citations. So this is specifically parenthetical citations. How should you cite quoted material? So how should you reference quoted material so that your readers can access it easily? And then lastly, we'll look at bibliographies and bibliography entries which you will put on a Works Cited page, and how is it that you're supposed to set up that Works Cited page, and what do those individual bibliography entries look like. So, first off, keep in mind that even the OWL Purdue website will tell you to follow your instructor's guidelines. That is the most basic rule of MLA format. The reason I include this is because some of your teachers may ask you to do different things. This will be true if you're taking classes outside of this school. Uh, they may be using MLA, but the teacher may have some specific guidelines that they ask you to follow. Uh, one of the key aspects of MLA guidelines is the guideline to follow the instructions uh, from your teacher, uh, even if those instructions are slightly different from what the MLA style book requests. In formatting your paper, there are some general guidelines that need to be followed. First, you need to be sure that your paper is typed on 8.5 by 11 inch paper. This is a general guideline that is true of, of everything that you'll turn in. You need to double space everything on the page. This at times may look odd, but it is an MLA guideline. Everything is always, ever, only double-spaced. If you say that to yourself several hundred times, 
you'll remember it and it's it's worth repeating everything is always ever only double spaced use 12 point font i prefer times new roman there, there are a few fonts that are acceptable calibri is the default on Microsoft Word documents, and that is certainly fine. What you don't want to use is any novel, weird, cursive, or any font that's really outside the normal. You need to leave only one space after punctuation. This is a rule that is a little bit different from how people used to type papers in the past, but now the standard is to only use one space after a period. You must set all margins to one inch on all sides. The Microsoft Word default is one and a quarter inches. Do not do that. It must be one inch on all sides. The only exception to the one inch margin is that you will have your last name and page number in the top right hand margin about half an inch down from the edge of the page. So in the middle of that one inch margin on the top right hand corner you will have your last name and the page number. Everything else, all other margins, are set to exactly one inch. You also need to indent the first line of a paragraph half an inch. It's a standard format uh, for every paragraph in your essay, with the exception of block quotes. Another few general guidelines is you have to have a header located in the upper right hand corner of your page. This is a standard kind of header uh, that we'll go through the details of it later on. A few other general points that I want to just bring up here. You must use italics for the titles of large works that you cite, including books, websites, magazine titles, and other things that are that contain a number of other works. Uh, basically, large works or works that are made up of other works need to be in italics. Smaller works or works that fit into larger works, their titles need to be placed in quotation marks, not in italics. So chapter titles, poems, magazine article titles, all of those need to be placed in quotation marks, not in italics. The title of your own essay is not changed at all. It is standard plain font, no italics, no quotation marks. In some more advanced writing scenarios, you may use endnotes. These are generally placed before the list of works cited. We will not use endnotes in any of the papers that you will turn in to me for this class. The first page will have all of these components. First, there is no title page. In some other forms of formatting, uh, you will have a, pay, a, a title page. That is not the case with MLA. Uh, next, you must make sure you double space everything. The heading on the first page uh, will have four elements that are in this order, starting at the top of the page you will have your first and last name. Under that, you will have your instructor's name. In my case, Mr. Wheeler. The, underneath that, the next line, you will have the title of the course. Uh, whatever the case is, you'll put the course uh, underneath my name. And then you'll put the date uh, underneath the course name. The date has to be in a specific order. You move from the the day to the month to the year uh, would be the standard format with no punctuation in the date. Then you will center a title for your paper uh, next on your page. There will be no uh, uh, no underlining, uh, no italics, no quotation marks, no bold font. You don't do anything special to the title. You simply have the title there on page. The title should be capitalized in a standard way. The header will be placed in the upper right hand corner as I mentioned before and it will simply be your last name and page number. You do not have to include the header on the first page of an MLA paper but it must appear on all subsequent pages. This is what a standard MLA formatted page 
will look like. Notice the heading where you have the student name, the instructor's name, the title of the class, and then you have the date, 12 October 2008. And then you have the, the title of the essay. Again, there's no underlining, there's no bold, there's no italics, there's no quotation marks. Now, if you were to put the name of another work in the title, so a review of a scarlet letter, you would then put a scarlet letter in italics. Notice the heading in the top uh, right hand corner. It is about halfway down the one inch margin and it is simply the uh, last name and the page number. There should only be one space between your last name and the page number. That can be difficult to accomplish and I'm actually not sure that it's done correctly on this sample page here. Let's then talk about in-text citations. When we talk about the basics of an in-text citation, it is a brief reference in your text that indicates the source that you have consulted or that you are quoting in some way. You need to include this kind of citation anytime you use information from another source. It should point your readers directly to the entry on your work cited page for that source. There has to be enough information in the in-text citation so that your reader can find his or her way directly to the source on your work cited page that you are referring to in that in-text citation. Usually the in-text citations are, appear in the form of a parenthesis and that parenthesis includes some form of the title that will easily be identified when the reader looks at your works cited page. But it also needs to be unob unobtrusive. It should not take up a lot of space. It should not get in the way of reading the essay. And so those are just some of the, the guidelines that have to be observed carefully. You want it to be clear. You want it to be useful. But you don't want it to get in the way of your own writing. In general, the in-text citation will be the author's last name, or if there is no author given, it will be an abbreviated title of the work with a page number, and this will be enclosed in parentheses after the quoted material before the period that ends that sentence. So, uh, you must provide a citation anytime you quote, paraphrase, or summarize someone else's work. This is a matter of integrity. This is a matter of being honest. It's a matter of not claiming somebody else's intellectual property as your own. If you use somebody else's work, if you use their wording, if you use their ideas, if you use their organization, if you use anything that somebody else has said, you must cite it. If you forget to cite something that you have seen somewhere else, you have committed plagiarism, either intentionally or unintentionally, it is still the same offense. Plagiarism includes any time you use another person's words, ideas, or organization without giving credit to that work, and it is quite simply intellectual theft. Plagiarism is theft, and it is cheating and it will be treated that way. Let's talk then about how these in-text citations show up. So again, you're balancing two things. On one hand, you want the citation to be clear. On the other hand, you don't want the citation to take up more space in your text than it has to. So there's actually three forms that this citation can take. If you look at this paragraph, there's actually three different ways that this work is cited. So the same quotation is cited in three different ways. Now it may have been clear if I'd actually broken this out into separate lines, but 
I still want to talk through it and show you what's going on here. So Wordsworth stated that romantic poetry was marked by the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Now, because I have already told you in the flowing text that Wordsworth is the author I am referring to, I do not need to put Wordsworth's name in the parenthesis. Because Wordsworth is in the text of the sentence, I can then go to my work cited page, find the work by Wordsworth, and know that this quotation came from page 263 of Wordsworth's work. If, on the other hand, I do not have Wordsworth's name in the text of the sentence, and so I simply say, romantic poetry is characterized by the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. The same quotation, right? The same quotation has to be cited differently because we don't know what work this is from. If I only had page 263, we wouldn't know which of the many works on the work cited page this quotation came from. And so it is imperative at this point that I put Wordsworth in the parenthesis, in the parenthetical citation. Notice that I do not put a comma or punctuation or hyphen or dash or question mark or colon or any other mark or punctuation between Wordsworth and the page number. I simply put the author's last name and I put the page number. And that citation is correct as well. Uh, the third example, if I was to have one here, would be, for example, if I said, Wordsworth on page 263 tells us that he believes... Uh, romanticism is characterized by the open quote spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings period close quote at that point because I have all the information in the flowing text of the sentence I do not need to have any information in a parenthetical citation now let's look at a, a few more examples here so if I'm quoting here uh, from this, this passage from Kenneth uh, Burke. So humans have been described by Kenneth Burke as uh, symbol-using animals. Three, right? Uh, open parenthesis, three, close parenthesis. Notice again the order here. The quote marks, the parenthetical citation, the period, that's the standard order. Here, uh, there is no reference to Kenneth Burke. And so you have to put Burke and the page number in the parenthetical citation. When you do not have a known author, right? so you use a source that does not have a known author, in that case, uh, you can use the uh, an abbreviated form of the title if the title is very long. Now, I want to warn you, there are very few cases in which it is acceptable to use a work that does not have a known author. In most cases, if you try to cite a work that does not have a known author, I'm going to tell you to find a different source. Because if there is nobody who is willing to take responsibility for the credibility of the information, then I am not going to consider the information credible in most cases. There are exceptions some organizations, some government websites, but I just wanted to say that in most cases, if you do not have an author, I don't want to see a reference to it. You might as well be citing Wikipedia. If nobody's taking responsibility for it, then the credibility of the information is severely suspect. You want to then make sure that whatever you use when you don't have the author, matches exactly what the reader will find if they go to your work cited page. So the impact of global warming, um, that should be what they see when they go to the work cited page. The impact of global warming in North America. You don't want to use an abbreviation like in North America, which does not really help the reader find your citation on your work cited page. They would have to read uh, more into the title to find it. In this case, they can look and, and, and 
basically find your reference by going alphabetically down the works cited page which which is a convention they should be able to use in order to find your resources when they turn to the works cited page if you have multiple works by the same author so if i'm citing for example uh, I'm, I'm writing a paper and i quote from several books by c.s lewis right so if i do that then i need to distinguish in each citation which of lewis's books i'm referring to in the example on the page here the author that has been quoted multiple times has the last name elkins and so what the writer has done because they have quoted from multiple essays by elkins they put elkins last name and then a comma and then they put a shortened form of the title of the essay by elkins that they are quoting then they put the page number notice there is a comma between the author's last name and the title of the article that's being quoted now how do i know this was an article well it's not just that i uh, know the article that was quoted it's because the title was placed in quotation marks i know that this was not a book it was not a large work it was a shorter work that is part of a larger collection of works and that is why it's placed in quotation marks but nonetheless this is the format that you would use in my first example where i've quoted from multiple works by c.s lewis so if one of the works by c.s lewis was the problem of pain i would put in parenthesis lewis comma the problem or problem of pain if it was page 64 i'd put 64 close parenthesis and that would be my citation if you're citing a multi-volume work uh, you would then uh, put quintillion or in this case quintillion is in the flowing text so you don't need the last name in the parenthesis and you put the volume number and then the page numbers so volume number colon page number and you're citing the bible this is an important uh, bit of information because hopefully all of you will cite from the bible frequently in every paper you write for me Ezekiel saw what seemed to be four living creatures, each with the face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. And this, uh, then you have the parenthetical citation, right? New Jerusalem Bible, comma, Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Now, there's several features to this that have, you have to pay attention to. This tells you which version of the Bible is being quoted. That's important, but it's only important the first time that you cite. Later on, you don't have to include the version of the Bible unless you have used multiple versions in your paper. If you use multiple versions and you're switching back and forth between versions, then every time you use the Bible, you need to put the version of the Bible that you are quoting from. The abbreviation for the books of the Bible are standard. You need to look them up. Don't assume that you know them. Uh, you, it is imperative that you use the proper MLA abbreviation. I've included a link here that you can follow or you can simply do a search and download documents that show you uh, what the proper abbreviations are for the books of the Bible in MLA format. You can also get this out of the MLA handbook. Let's talk a bit about one of the trickier features of, cit of citations in MLA format. This is sort of a subset where, where you talk about how to quote a longer passage of material. So if you're quoting four or five lines, if you're quoting uh, quotations for five or more lines of prose, um, and if you're quoting uh, three or more lines of poetry, uh, you need to format those in a different way. 
in what is called a block quotation. And I'll look at each of those examples now. So if you're doing a block quotation, which is five or more lines of prose, you need to indent the entire quotation as a block. And so you'll indent half an inch, which is the same amount of space as you would normally indent the first line of a paragraph, only you do not indent the first line of this paragraph any differently from how you indent the rest of this text. So there should be a straight line down half an inch in. You do not indent on the right hand side. So it's only on the left hand side. You indent half an inch. When you're using a block quotation, you do not put quotation marks around the quoted material. It is understood that this is a quotation because of how it is formatted. Then you will place your end punctuation after the quotation and following the end punctuation, and note that this is different from any other quotation. In most quotations, you would place the end punctuation after the parenthetical citation. In this case, you do not. You place the period, then you end with the parenthetical citation, and there is no mark of punctuation after the parenthetical citation in this case. Notice that is different from how you would normally format this uh, a quotation. So there are several differences here. I'm just going to list through them one more time. If you have a block quotation, and a block quotation is what you need to do if your quote is five or more lines of prose. Okay. If in doubt, if it's close to five, go ahead and put it in a block quotation because once you indent that half an inch for each line, it will definitely be more than five lines. And so that will qualify for a block quotation. You need to indent all of the text. The first thing you do is you indent all of the text half an inch. And the uh, left hand side is flush, half an inch indented all the way down for all five lines. You do not place quotation marks around the quotation. You do place the period immediately after the quotation followed by the parenthetical citation. These are all important features of a block quotation. Now, let me say this as well. Block quotations should be used extremely rarely in most cases, a block quotation is completely unnecessary and it will result in a deduction of points if it is simply wasting space that should be devoted to analysis and careful thought. So please do not use block quotations loosely. In most cases, they are completely unnecessary. When you're quoting poetry, you will use block quotations as well and the, uh, but you'll maintain the line breaks that you usually have uh, in poetry. So you'll quote the poetry exactly the way it is in the, uh, in the original text. You'll, you'll have the uh, capitalization of every first line. You will end the lines where it ends. And that's what you do with if, you have th if you're quoting three or more lines of poetry. I do want to, to talk a little bit about quoting poetry uh, here as well. And this is if you're not using a block quotation. Okay, so, so this, is, this is only quoting two lines. You do need, when you're quoting poetry, you need to put a forward slash if you quote poetry and you quote more than one line. So if there's a line break, uh, because you're not using a block quotation, right? Um, so, so please note that my examples here are of what you do when you're not doing a block quotation. And I just, I wanted to cover this here because I know where else to put it, but it's just an important aspect of punctuation that you need to know. If you're quoting poetry, right? If you're quoting poetry and you're not quoting three or more lines because you're not then going to break it up into the lines, you need to let your reader know where that line break would occur. 
the way you let your reader know is to put a space, a forward slash, another space, and then begin the second line of the poetic quotation. If your quotation goes over a stanza, so if you have a stanza break, right? Remember that poetry is divided into lines and into stanzas. That your stanzas are like your paragraphs of poetry. If you go over a stanza, then you need to put double forward slashes to indicate that there was actually not just a line break, but a stanza break between the lines that you are quoting. Now, obviously, all of this would be unnecessary if you're doing a block quotation because then you'll just put the poem in in the form that it was originally right with the line breaks and the stanza breaks but if you're if you're if you're putting the the, the text of the poem into the flowing text of your writing then you need to indicate line breaks and stanza breaks line breaks are indicated by a single forward slash stanza breaks are indicated by a double forward slash one right after another now moving on Let's talk about another uh, sort of odd feature of quoting material. This is if you're quoting something and you, you need to add in some word, a word or two, in order to make the text flow with your sentence. So you may want to uh, change the tense of a word or something like that so that it flows in with your writing. If you see here uh, the quotation uh, from uh, Jan Harold, he wants to insert that so that the individuals, the kind of individual, is clear. The way you insert that is by putting the insertion in the quotation in brackets, in square brackets. Square brackets tells your reader that this is information that is not in the original quotation, but you believe it is true to the original quotation. So you have not changed the meaning of the original quote in any way. You've simply added a few words to make the quote clearer or to make it flow with what you're saying or, you, or to make it uh, easier for the reader to understand in the context. But if the reader went back and read the original, they would not feel that you misled them. So, so this is this is the convention that you must use with integrity. You've got to be careful that the way you use it is true to the original text. The other uh, special mark of punctuation that you need to be familiar with are the ellipsis dots. And these are the three dots that indicate that you have left something out. Please never put the ellipsis dots at the beginning or end of a quotation. Everyone knows that when you quote something, you have not quoted the entire piece. It is understood that there is material still at the beginning or at the end of what you're quoting. The only time you use ellipsis dots is if you have left material out of the middle of a quote or out of the inside an internal part of the quotation has been left out. If that internal part of the quotation that has been left out goes over a sentence, you use four dots. One of those dots represents the period, the other four dots are ellipsis dots. If it only goes over material that is within a sentence, then just use the three ellipsis dots to indicate that you have left some material out. Obviously, here again, this must be done with integrity. You cannot leave out information that is crucial to an understanding of the passage. Let's now talk about works cited and bibliography page formatting. 